Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Okay, I think most people who are joining have gotten in. Welcome, everyone. Sorry about the brief delay. My name is Chris Bostic. I'm the Policy Director for Action on Smoking and Health, and I'm here today with my colleague, Carol Matum, who runs our California Endgame program. And uh, this webinar is part of a series of four webinars that discusses how we need to think beyond individual cessation when we're thinking about tobacco control and think about all the ways that the, uh, the tobacco industry and tobacco products have sort of infiltrated our world and where we need to get them out of it. So today's uh, focus is uh, on the planet. So who needs to quit tobacco if the planet has to do it? And um, Carol is gonna start us off on the presentation. Thanks, Chris, and welcome everyone today. Um, we all know that the environmental and health impacts of tobacco are vast and growing. So I think this is a timely presentation. Um, today, Oh, today we're going to look at the five E's. This is all an alternative way of looking at the five A's of cessation, ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. We will be looking today at examine, explore, explain, expect, and emphasize. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, tobacco doesn't negatively impact the health of individuals. It also endangers the health of our environment. Every year, tobacco is responsible for approximately 600 million trees lost, a 5% of global deforestation, 84 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions, and over 800,000 pounds of toxic chemicals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh. Um, tobacco hoarder culture uses large amounts of chemical fertilizer and pesticides. The negative impact of this tobacco production and use is not balanced by positive contributions to society. Further, workers who plant, cultivate, and harvest tobacco are at risk of suffering from a form of nicotine poisoning known as green tobacco sickness. This illness causes nausea and vomiting, and it can lead to hospitalizations and lost work time. We know that the tobacco industry produces large amounts of tobacco product waste. However, did you know that the cities of San Francisco and Los Angeles spend between seven and $20 million each year to do tobacco waste cleanup? Now cigarette, oh, I'm having trouble with my mouse today, sorry folks. Cigarette fiddlers are, uh, contribute to microplastic contamination. A single filter can contaminate up to 132 gallons of water. And when ingested, the hazardous chemicals cause long-term mortality in marine life. But even more, these chemicals end up in our waterways and they take several, several years to biodegrade. As we said, cigarette, hmm. Sorry, folks, I'm having trouble here. Hmm, going forward and it's going backwards. Cigarette filters do not reduce the damage um, caused by cigarettes. In fact, their function is to make smoking less harsh smoothing the way for initiation. So the use of filters actually results in higher puff volumes and more frequent puffs. Uh, this provides for more toxins available to be inhaled deeper into the lungs with greater retention of nicotine and toxic chemicals.
Now, when we look at e-cigarettes, we know that the lithium, lithium ion batteries are not regulated and the batteries may be of inferior quality. So there are, can be several uh, different types of explosions. Um, people have reported lacerations to the face, eyes, mouth, and hands. And recent studies suggest that there's over approximately 200,000 injuries in the U.S. resulting from e-cigarette explosions, and that was from 2015 to 17. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris, who will then take us through the rest of our E's. Great, thank you, Carol. So th this is obviously a huge problem, and it, it's it's second only to the uh, to the health impacts of of tobacco products. So we have a double reason to do something about it. So I'm going to explore a bit about what our options are to uh, address this issue. Before I start, I just want to say, uh, as I always do, that uh, this is what governments are for, and they don't just have a right; uh, they have a duty to protect their citizens from third parties like the tobacco industry, and to provide the highest attainable standard of health and the highest attainable standard of a healthy environment. And this is a no brainer in terms of uh, bring, bringing those uh, qualities to your people. Next slide. So what are some of the policies that we can do? First, we can get rid of cigarettes altogether. That would at least get rid of the filters. Uh, if, you, if we wanna go further and get rid of all tobacco products, fine. We'd get rid of the, the plastic waste from uh, e-cigarettes as well. Uh, you can also uh, lump it into uh, a bigger environmental uh, policy by banning single-use plastics. Now, this has actually been done in several countries around the world, but so far, every country that's done it has exempted cigarette filters for some reason. So we got to make sure that they, they don't get exempted. They should be the first one. We can also urge the U.S. Um, oh, can you go back one? Sorry. Um, we can also urge the U.S. to push for a, a, a ban on these products in the tobacco, uh, in the treaty negotiations that are going on right now, the UN treaty to eliminate plastic pollution. For the next two years, uh, countries will meet and discuss how we can uh, address plastic pollution. And one of the main uh, uh, policies on the table is to get rid of single use plastics that are, that are non-essential. And, uh, and of course, filters fill that easily. Next slide. Another thing we can do is assess a fee for every cigarette to, uh, to pay cities, cities, counties, and states back for the costs of picking up um, filters. San Francisco has done this. Uh, they were sued by the industry, but they won, so it is still in effect. Um, I'm going to just note that this is not the ideal solution because uh, we still get the, th the cigarette filters into the environment. Uh, there are 4.5 trillion thrown in a year. And just as a juxtaposition to that, I went and looked up uh, Ocean Conservancy's efforts to, uh, they're the biggest collector of cigarette butts in the world. And in 2021, they collected 1.2 million cigarette butts from around the world, which sounds really impressive. But I ran that through a calculator and that is 0.00000003% of the number of filters that are being thrown into the environment. So th this is not gonna get us out of the problem, but it might be a stopgap. And of course, in the meantime, at least it will reduce demand slightly. Next slide. We can also just ban filters. Uh, cigarettes don't have to have them. Uh, they don't do any good. In fact, they make, they make it worse, as Carol said. So we can force the tobacco industry to sell cigarettes without filters. And my guess is that a lot of people who smoke would find it a lot easier to quit uh, if, if, the filters were, if the filters were gone. Um, so far, no one in the world has, has done this. It was actually in the New Zealand bill that passed Parliament in December at one point, but it was taken out during the parliamentary process. So we're still looking for that first example. Next slide. Another thing we can do is ban tobacco use in all outdoor public areas because that's where cigarette butts get, tend to get flung out. Um, we can't really ban uh, outdoor smoking altogether, but we can do it in places that are owned by the government. Um, a lot of places have already done this, especially in California, uh, but a lot more still need to do it. And uh, it, would be a, it would be a good step in the right direction. Next slide. And finally, we can just raise awareness. Uh, I don't think I don't think people really know about this. Uh, I, I did go to the first uh, negotiating round of that plastics treaty, and I was kind of shocked to find out that the the uh, environmental community, uh, not NGO community, believed that filters were made cigarettes healthier. And I, I can't blame them in retrospect because you know it has the word filter, which we normally think of as doing some good. Uh, so we have a lot of a lot of work to do in in raising awareness. Uh, it, it's not a little thing, you know, this is, this is the biggest source of plastic pollution in the world. And, uh, you know, as we know, plastic pollution is, is choking our, our coastlines and, and poisoning our water. Next slide. 
yep, you can just jump to the next one. So I'm going to go through some of the uh, counter arguments that you're going to get and then the counter counter arguments. So one argument Carol has already answered that, that filters are designed to reduce tar and chemical intake. And if you look at a cigarette butt, a used filter, you, you could be led to believe that because they, they are full of toxins. But the amount of uh, toxins that they take out and carcinogens they, that they take out of the smoke is minuscule and it doesn't do anything to, to reduce the effect of, of those chemicals on, on lungs and on bodies. Uh, as Carol said, these things were not put there to make cigarettes healthier. They were put there to make them seem healthier back in the 50s when people were first starting to wonder about the health impacts of smoking. So the, the counter argument is that we have, we have lots, of uh, lots of data and research out there showing that there's no health benefit and that there's actually some ha additional harm caused by uh, using cigarette filters. Next slide. Now, what always comes up in environmental discussions is uh, let the let the market take care of it. Let the, let the invisible hand of the economy do it. So make the industry police itself, and they have to fund litter cleanups and and etc. Um, that's that's going to be a tall ask. Uh, first of all, the industry has always denied the polluter pays principle, and it's it's not going to voluntarily say we're going to uh, fix this problem. Um, they've never kept promises, even if they did make that uh, make that promise. And of course, as we already went over, they can't possibly pick up even 1% of the, of the cigarette filters that are being discarded into the environment. Uh, no one could. Next slide. So uh, I've heard the argument many times that if we get rid of filters, we, we might get rid of cigarettes. As I said before, people would stop smoking. And our counter argument there is good. Uh, the, these horrible uh, <clears throat> pollutants are attached to the leading cause of uh, preventable death in the world. If if that if we can get a twofer for that, that's a that's a very powerful argument. Next slide. And of course, the uh, age old argument for every uh, tobacco control policy: uh, government budgets are dependent on tobacco revenues, and they're not completely not completely wrong. Um, but we we should always point out that this this isn't the way it should be. It, it, that's abnormal to have the government dependent on a financial stream that is dependent on people getting sick and dying. And that, so we need to find new sources of revenue. Of course, in the long run, if we were to get rid of tobacco, we would save uh, billions of dollars because the, the costs are much, much higher than the, than the taxes. It's just that the, uh, the savings don't uh, reveal themselves right away because it takes a while for tobacco to, to kill people. Next slide. You can just go on. So what can we expect from the opposition? Uh, first, of course, retailers, wholesalers, and, and distribution networks for tobacco products are, are going to hate anything that we do, especially if we're going to get rid of filters or cigarettes. It's going to drive them out of business. Uh, so they will it will be all hands on deck, uh, deck for them. Um, we, we're working on some arguments um, that, that can sway uh, uh, decision makers about uh, re uh, retailers going out of business, especially um, small retailers uh, tend to be seen as a, a essential part of, of a community, uh, and they're, uh, when they come and speak at, at council meetings, people take them seriously. Um, so we're, we're working on ways to, to, uh, to uh, deal with that and, and even ways that we can get some of the retail sector to support us. Next slide. We can also expect opposition from Congress, and in this case, I'm talking about both uh, in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., uh, the tobacco industry is is among the largest donors uh, to political campaigns in the world. Uh, they're usually first or second. Every now and then, big oil beats them in terms of how much money they throw into politics. Uh, but they the, it, that's one of the reasons that we haven't been able to get anything done at the at the federal level. Uh, it, it's simply impossible. That's why we haven't ratified the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, the president never bothered to send it to the Senate because he knew that it would fail. And it's not it's not a party issue. Both both parties have people that uh, uh, that take money from the tobacco industry. Next, and always emphasize that this is happening one way or the other. When I love this slide, it says the end is coming. We're not. This isn't doom saying. This is saying that the end of the tobacco epidemic is coming, and how we get at it uh, is almost irrelevant in the long run. We need to we need a world where these products are are gone and and they're not poisoning us personally or poisoning the uh, poisoning the planet. And I think that is uh, that is it, right, Carol? Correct. Okay. Um, I would love to have a discussion, folks. Um, I, I think it works by uh, you can you can put things into the Q and A, and we can read them out and uh, and try to answer them.
Oh, I see one that's here already. Banning all single-use plastic has devastating impacts on disabled communities. How would you plan to address that in the solution that attempts to ban all single-use plastics to prevent pollution? Uh, I'm not quite sure I completely understand the question. Uh, banning banning the filters would have a negative impact on disabled communities, but I'm not sure how. Can you can you write something more in the Q and A? Oh, banning all single-use plastics. Yes. Well, um, in the in the treaty negotiations, it's a very particular set of plastics that they're targeting. It's not just that they're uh, single-use. They have to be single-use, problematic from a litter standpoint, uh, toxic, and non-essential. And so if, if, if something was going to harm a community like that, it would be deemed essential and it would be treated differently uh, because the treaty is not going to be a one-size-fits-all. Different plastics are going to have different different regulations. Um, so I think I think we're safe we're safe there from the treaty standpoint, at least. Let's see, many single use plastics are used to make accessibility products are essential for disabled people to feed themselves. Uh, yeah, that makes that makes sense. Uh, hopefully my previous answer um, uh, addresses that. And I should say that you know, Ash, Ash and the tobacco control community are, are not pushing for blanket bans. Uh, we are, we're pushing for the, the bans of those, uh, those plastic products that have those four characteristics. I hope we get some more questions. Oh, and I'm just, I've just been told that we can allow, um, if, if you'd like to ask your question verbally, we can, uh, we can turn on your mic. Oh, here's, um, my organization is having trouble getting others to understand tobacco as an environmental justice issue. Do you have any tips on how to get people involved in our cause? That's a good, good question and a very, very important one. Um, Carol, can I put you on the spot first? Because I think we have some materials uh, that we've produced for, for California that can be used, uh, used in this endeavor. I'm sorry, Chris, could you repeat the question? I was dealing uh, with my computer. Uh, the, uh, someone is asking about um, tips on how to get people more involved in the environmental side of uh of end game and tobacco control and i think we've we've at, we'd actually have produced some materials yes um we've produced materials on how to handle the concept of end game for folks for decision makers layman's and community members um, we have those on our website which i'll be uh, sharing with you in just a moment um, we've called them talking points or counter arguments and they do address they do have some questions in there that address the environmental perspective it would also be nice to know from the community of those who are participating today if there are documents or uh, materials that you would find helpful in your work that uh, you could let us know and we might be able to develop for you and if i can add there there, there is an organization that uh, that focuses entirely on on cigarette filters that's um What's, what is Tom Novotny's group? Ban butts or something like that? I'll, I'll try to find it and put it in the in the chat. He has a lot of materials and a lot of information, including uh, including research on it. Um, I also want to point out that uh, it, it, this can be an important part of tobacco control. Environmental groups understand this. And uh, Manhattan Beach, which was the second city to ban the sale of all tobacco products, that campaign was largely run by surf riders because they were tired of having to pick up cigarette butts on the beach. And it's just one of their things. Um, so it, it, this is a powerful ally to have um, in your community if, if just identify the environmental groups that are uh, that are there. Uh, oh, good. And uh, uh, Megan has pasted the uh, the link to uh, the Cigarette Waste Project. Let's see. Can you talk a bit about e-cigarettes and how they affect the environment? Also advice on the best way to dispose of them if you know. I'll, I'll answer the second question first. I, I don't know, and I don't know that anybody does uh this is a this is something we can we can bring up in the uh to uh to the other group tom novotny's group but uh there is research going on but we presently i don't believe there's any way to properly dispose of and recycle uh any tobacco product uh plastic plastic waste um in terms of the uh the, the impact of e-cigarette plastic waste on the environment, that is also largely unknown. 
Um, and it's not something that uh, has been tracked for very long. So we don't we know how many filters are in the environment because we've been looking at it for years, but we don't know exactly how much of the uh, of the waste from e-cigarettes is getting into the environment. But uh, when we are talking about banning these the, you know, the single use, non-essential, et cetera, uh, plastics, I think we can easily include uh, e-cigarette plastic waste because they're certainly non-essential and toxic and single use. And not, um, yeah, they, they're, they should be uh, able to be included. What about products like candles that use cotton filters? Um, that, that is a problem. Um, if, if the industry was to move to uh, you know, organic, non-plastic uh, filters, uh, the plastics treaty wouldn't be able to, uh, wouldn't cover it anymore. But uh, it's still a, a useless uh, uh, device on the end of a terribly dangerous product. And, and so it, it, it's not like we couldn't ban it if it wasn't plastic. We just wouldn't be able to do it along with other uh, you know, plastics that, are, that we need to get rid of. Hey. Can I uh, jump in here? Oh, and of course, please. Address that? Sure. So uh, the camels, film camel filters are just like every other cigarette filter. They're all made out of plastic. I don't know how this mythology around camel grew up, but that's that's all it is. Uh, the industry has tried to develop biodegradable filters and they have never succeeded. And uh, there are a lot of reasons why it's not in, in their interest to do so. Um, and we have some literature about that, uh, which I'd be happy to, uh, I can now, uh, we can disseminate the links to that to that literature. So um, if anyone tells you that about camels, not true. <laughs> That's good to know. I didn't know that either, Libby. Um, does the FDA under the Tobacco Control Act have regulatory authority to ban cigarette filters since they regulate the production of cigarettes? And does FDA have an interest in the environment? We have actually spoken to folks at uh, at the Center for Tobacco Products about this exact issue, and and there is some interest. Um, and it would obviously be best to do this at the at the national level. Not only would it cover everything, it would uh, it would get rid of problems with potential federal preemption. Uh, the industry has argued that for uh, for every. Uh, flavor ban bill that's gone through the country, uh, at local and state level. And this one's even, uh, and that's that's with an explicit right for states to do such things. Uh, this is a little more muddy, so it would definitely be better um, better at the, done by at the federal level. But I wouldn't hold your breath. Uh, just like with anything else, it's going to take many years uh, for the FDA to do it if, if they can. Uh, so we need to be thinking locally at the, at the same time. Let's see. Anybody else just want to jump in, please, please do. Are there any best practices available to share or, gui or guidance available regarding how to dispose of disposable vapes? My understanding that each piece needs to be disposed of separately, but the product is marketed as disposable and not safe to disable. Yeah, we partially answered that in the uh, with, for the previous question. Um, but yeah, I hadn't, that hadn't even, hadn't even occurred to me that uh, the, there's different plastics and there's a battery in a lot of e-cigarettes that uh, you can't dispose of together, certainly can't recycle them together. Um, so that just compounds the uh, the difficulty in dealing with them. E-cigarettes as well cause a lot of environmental issues. Is that an issue decision makers have been worried about? Yes, it is. And uh, from, a, from an advocacy standpoint, uh, at least at the treaty level, we've been using filters as sort of the poster child of uh, tobacco product waste. Uh, but in the fine print, we are always including uh, e-cigarette waste, uh, plastic waste as well. Um, and we're, you know, we don't know exactly how bad it is, uh, but we know it's bad and getting worse just because uh, there, uh, more and more people are using vapes and more and more being uh, disposed of. I think uh, I'm just going to click on that link real quick. Oh, there you go. There's some resources at CDC that I did not know existed. Thank you very much, Pamela. And I see another link to the WHO as well. Um, so uh, yes, and the WHO has actually taken a, a big interest in this issue. Um, they weren't able to attend the first negotiating session of the Plastics Pollution Treaty, but they are coming to the second one. And so we'll have a, a powerful voice alongside us. Um, and, and they're mainly there because of tobacco. That, that's their, although they, they, they have a broader mandate about, uh, about health and the right to health, uh, they, they recognize that the tobacco issue is the, is the main one. Uh, how is plastic considered essential in regards to a single-use plastic ban, 
what guidelines do they use? So for example, plastic straws are essential for accessibility reasons for disabled <laughs> communities, but could be argued as non-essential for the general population. Um, that's an excellent question. And this is, this is gonna be um, part of the uh, difficulty in the plastics treaty. Uh, the, the United Nations Environmental Program has a list of plastics and they've categorized them, but it isn't set in stone. And uh, there's all the, there's little things like this that are gonna have to be considered. Um, so uh, we'll have to wait and see and, and see how they, they go about it. Um, and I'm not even sure how, because some, some places have banned plastic straws. I'm not sure if they have made exceptions uh, for disabled communities or, or how they've dealt with that, but um, yeah, a big complicated issue that, that remains unresolved. Oh, and Pamela has sent another one too. Thank you very much. Right, and that, that third one, that's from the Stop Tobacco Pollution Alliance uh, that was uh, co-founded by Ash and uh, GDTC, which is a, a watchdog for tobacco industry interference. And I think we have around uh, 30 organizational members now. Uh, and so that we, we created this, uh, this consortium to, uh, to negotiate the treaty, but also to take a broader approach to, uh, uh, to tobacco and the environment. Sorry, I went very quickly. Anybody on the panel have anything to add? Okay, Carol, are there any housekeeping things that we need to do? Uh, there is one particular item that I would like to get to. Let me see. Uh, we at ASH have an opportunity to spotlight your organization on our endtobaccoca.ash.org website. Uh, we'd love it if you would go to our website, which I'll put the link in the chat in just a moment, and submit to be our next month's Organization of Excellence. This is an opportunity for you to spotlight your activities that you're doing. It's not a time-consuming process, and we would love to be able to promote all of your activities to other folks that are also in the field. Uh, as I said, I will put the uh, re link to do that in the chat in just a moment. And with that being said, if there are no other questions, then I think we're going to be able to uh, give some folks some time today. Yeah, I don't think we have any further questions. Thank you all very much for for uh, for tuning into this and um, look be, be on the lookout for the other two uh, webinars in this series. We're going to do one per month, and so we will have one in April and one in May. Great, thank you, everyone. Please enjoy your day. <laughs>